Oh, Acts chapter 14. To our guests, we only act like this some of the time. <laughs> Acts chapter 14. And I want us to go to verse 21. And we'll read through 28. Acts chapter 14, verses 21 through 28. Because walls to fall, fall miracles. Yes, you did. Acts chapter 14, verse 21. And here's what reads the word of the Lord. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Verse 24 says, Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them. And how he had made a way for the Gentiles. He opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So as I stated earlier, we've been going through the book of Acts. This sermon series we've called Multiply. And we've been going through Acts, and just to give you a preview of what's coming in the weeks ahead, this will be our last sermon installment from Acts for um, a few months. We're going to take a break, and we're going to go into a summer series, um, if it ever gets here, and this series, I've been wanting to preach for a year, but heaven had not given me clearance to do so. But they've, heaven has said, now is the time. But the number of new young marrieds in this church, the new babies we have in this church, new parents in this church, established marriages and families in this church, for this summer, I want to go through a series of sermons um, from this title, Modern Family Vintage Values. Modern Family Vintage Values. And so next week, we'll start this family series on Mother's Day um, and continue it through the end of July. And the first couple of weeks, we'll talk about the functional family. And we'll come from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and then in Genesis 3, we'll see the beginning of the dysfunctional family, and if there's any hope for the dysfunctional family. And we'll have a chance to speak to married couples, we'll have a chance to speak to parents, um, we'll have a chance to speak to singles as well. I'm excited about this, so encourage, this would be a great series to invite um, unsaved friends, family, uh, people who are in this new stage of life to come and hear God's way for doing life for the family. So as we complete our first installment of Acts chapter 14, we'll come back to it in the fall. We've seen what we've been studying the last few weeks is Paul's first missionary journey. Starting in Antioch of Syria, he then proceeds to go 
east and north. Uh, and then he ends up last week, we were talking about how Paul were, was in the region of Galatia. And he went through these cities proclaiming the gospel. And so now we see today in our text, we are met with the completion of Paul's first missionary journey in the book of Acts. Because now he's going to retrace his steps. And it is intentional that he retraces his steps. And what I love about preaching through books of the Bible is that you get to hit on so many different topics and it doesn't seem like you're on some kind of hobby horse. And so what today, what we're going to see from Acts 14 verses 21 through 28, through 28 excuse me, is what I'm calling the disciples' path. The disciples' path. And so essentially all we're going to see is how to make disciples. Look with me at the first step in disciple making. The first step in making disciples is we must share the gospel. The first step in disciple making is sharing the gospel. Where do we see that in the text, Brandon? Verse 21 says, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples. The word for preached there in verse 21 is where we get our word evangelize. So in other words, when they had evangelized that city, they made many disciples. The first step to making disciples is sharing the gospel. There is no way around it. Friends, there cannot be disciple-making apart from the sharing of the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the announcement of the good news that our sins have been dealt with, not in part but in whole, by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hear me clearly. The gospel is an announcement. It, it's been said, uh, uh, Francis of Assisi has been attributed with this quote, but nobody can actually find where he actually said this. It's been said by many preachers that we should preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Sounds good, but it's not good in sound. It's a very illogical statement, friends. The gospel, by definition, is news. It's an announcement. So you must use words. There is no evangelism without words. There's this whole idea of lifestyle evangelism. Yes, I think we should live a life worthy of the gospel. That's in the Bible. We should do that. But there can be no evangelism unless you use words. You can do certain things to create a bridge for you to cross over to share the gospel. But in order for you to actually have evangelized someone to preach the gospel, there must be this declaration, an announcement. There must be news. And the text says that when we are faithful witnesses, when a person is faithful to just sharing this news, disciples are made. Now, I've told you this before, but let me reiterate this because you're going to hear this and I want you to be informed. In the book of Acts, there is no uh, you are a Christian first and then you are a disciple. That is not the pattern of the Bible. In the Bible, the moment you place your trust in Jesus Christ, you are a disciple. Now, you may be able to, we can put some adjectives in front of that. You, we, you can be a new disciple, a young disciple, an immature disciple, a mature disciple. But as the moment a person believes you are a disciple of Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ at that very moment, Discipleship is not something that you uh, uh, elevate to or that you're promoted to or you graduate to. 
It's not the second level of Christian, Christianum. It is the moment you become, and once you are evangelized and you believe the gospel, you are a disciple. And friends, the reason this matters is that the discipleship matters because this is the reason the church exists, to make disciples. So Paul shows us a pattern here for disciple-making. Matter of fact, actually, the words that we're going to use is the disciple-making pathway for the British church. They must first share the gospel. And we say that not only in that first stage of sharing the gospel, there has to be sharing of life because now in our culture, uh, uh, evangelism is most effective in relationships. And so we tell people, share life with them. Go to where they are. Be with them. Get to know them. And then hopefully you've created a bridge where you can share the gospel. So the first stage of disciple making is share. Well, you share the gospel, and God gives you fruit from your faithfulness. What, what's next? Paul and Barnabas give us a model here. They made disciples, and what was their next step? Verse 22. They strengthened the souls of the disciples. Share the gospel, number two. Support the new believer. Share the gospel. Support the new believer. That word strengthen in verse 22 means to support. It means to establish something so that it stands upright and is immovable. No, notice here what Paul and Barnabas do. They don't leave these new believers there to fend for themselves. They don't just say, all right, we share the gospel now. You got to grow on your own. No, they follow up. They taught them the word. They modeled Christian living. And friends, I believe that this is the missing link in our discipleship. A lack of follow-up. A lack of support. A lack of strengthening. We must Walk alongside new believers by teaching them the word and how to live surrendered lives to Christ. Y'all might be quiet on me this morning, so let me tell you, let me see if I can paint a picture for you. The British church has been blessed with a number of new babies recently. I think about their development and their nurturing. One of the first things I learned about new babies was, when you get ready to hold them, you got to make sure you hold their head. Because their head too big. <laughs> their necks can't yet support that head. It, they're not able to balance it on their own. And if you don't give them some support, it'll just go all over the place. Not only do you have to help with their heads, but you also have to hold your head, your hand behind their backs as well. Because they're not able to support themselves. They're not strong enough to hold it up by themselves. And so we have these new babies. We got to support them. And then, well, this happened a long time ago. But then you start getting even more Facebook notices from these new parents. They want the world to stop because now their baby can turn over. <laughs> it's Facebook post worthy. Taylor been posting for the last nine months. I don't even know the baby yet. Don't know what it looked like. They roll over and then the next, next major Facebook post, look, my baby is crawling. Oh, sitting up. Thank you. I should have talked to a mom. They sit up. And now they can crawl. Then things get real. Next Facebook post. This is on Twitter too and Snapchat. They take their first step. Now. Every new baby that I've seen, 
take a first step. That first step has been very clumsy. They step, they try the next one, and next thing you know, they fall. They're on the ground. Or they take a couple of steps, and then they fall again. And what do we do? We take that baby by the hand, and we help them to stand upright. We, we become the support and strength for them so that they don't give up on walking and go back to crawling. Friends, that picture of that new baby is disciple-making 101. When our babies start crawling, what do we do? We start baby-proofing the whole house. You go buy those little clear plugs, put them in the electrical outlets. You put, uh, uh, unless, except for your Josh. Josh is like, well, she'll figure it out. <laughs> you put guards on the cabinets because you don't want them getting to all those different chemicals. You, 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 you look at your furniture, you see, oh my gosh, look at this sharp corner here. And you figure something out for that. This is the same care that must be taken with a new believer. We must learn, just like we teach our babies how to walk, we must teach new believers how to walk with Jesus Christ. We, we, we must warn them of impending danger. We must admonish them that the decision that they're making is foolish. Sometimes we have to protect them from themselves. Sometimes we have to point out to new believers that they are living. Watch this, not just new believers, but one another. We have to point out to one another when we are walking and living according to the flesh and not the spirit. We, we have to teach them God's point of view on a matter. And we do this by speaking the truth in love. Not our truth, but God's truth. We must constantly remind one another not to be of this world and tell each other when we are thinking and acting more like this world rather than the new world that we are citizens of. A new believer walking with Jesus Christ is just like a baby learning to walk physically. It's going to be clumsy at times. You're going to feel like, ooh, this was a good time we had with this believer. They, they made a step forward in their faith. And then a few hours later, they're going to take two steps backwards. They'll take two steps forward in their walk with Christ, and then another step backwards. It's going to be clumsy at times. But just like we treat our kids or our newborn babies, it's the same way we must treat a new believer. When that baby takes their first step and they fall, we don't say, oh, you're awful at this. Go back to crawling. I'm down with you. No, we pick them up and then we start walking alongside of them. And that's the same thing that we must do as we disciple one another. We must say, when you fall, I'm not going to give up on you. I'm not going to tell you to go back to crawling. But brother, sister in Christ, I've got you. I'm going to pick you up by the hand, and we're going to walk through this thing together. That's, what's, that's what has to happen when you are discipling someone. That word. So that means we must be patient. We must be sensitive, and we must be sympathetic with others who may not be as strong as us. That word strengthen in our text is in the present tense. The implication of that is that for Paul and Barnabas, this strengthening was a sustained effort. Not only were they patient and sensitive, but they were persistent in the strengthening of these new believers, these new churches. Look at what Paul and Barnabas do. They go back and they strengthen their souls. They strengthen them 
also by encouraging them to remain loyal to Jesus. Why do they need to encourage these new believers, these new churches, to remain loyal to Jesus? Here, look at the C clause of verse 22. They said to them, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Friends, the Christian life is, is not all health and wealth. It's not all joy and peace. It is all out war. I was sharing the gospel with someone recently, and I told them up front, I like to up, uh, 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 up front load the, this, this turning to Christ, repentance. And I told them that surrendering your life to Christ doesn't mean that your life is going to get better on this side of heaven. Most likely, you're going to suffer. You're going to experience many tests and trials. And Satan wants to destroy your new faith, and he will attack you and tempt you in every way. And church, here's the thing. He doesn't let up. This is not just the truth for a new believer, but this is the truth for every believer. The only way for us to enter the kingdom of God is going to be through many tribulations. There will be tests and trials. You never graduate from satanic attack. We used to, I, I used to, I heard an old preacher say, there's a new devil for every level. He was essentially saying that there's going to always be some kind of warfare as you grow in your walk with Christ. And so what's the application there from this truth? I, do, I say to you what Paul and Barnabas said to their churches, be encouraged. Don't give up. Keep fighting, keep living, keep serving, keep trusting. Satan has been defeated. We fight from a place of victory, not for victory. So church, we must support new believers. And that's exactly what our discipleship process does here at the bridge. We say, hey, you're a missionary, share the gospel. We see some fruit. Secondly, we've got to support them. How do we support them? We try to unite them with a one-on-one -on -one running partner. And we tell that running partner, they are now, you are now the spiritual mentor. You are the teacher. A disciple is a learner. For there to be a learner, there must be a teacher. And so we give them a one-on-one -on -one running partner because we are running this Christian race. And sometimes, listen, it don't take, if y'all told me to run from here to that back door, I'm going to be tired. And I'm going to be like, well, I'm going to go back to my old way of life of being just, uh, that's the word I want here. Mm, I'm just going to sit on my do nothing because that way of life was easier and more enjoyable. On, in this life, this Christian life, this race, we all get tired and we want to give up. And so what we do here at the bridge is we say, we're going to connect this new person or this young believer, this immature believer. We're going to connect them with someone that's a little stronger. And now that person who's stronger now has a responsibility to teach them by, by the word of God how to live, how to love God, how to love others. We're going to model for them the Christian life, which means that, that you are going to have to spend some time with this individual. That's probably the biggest challenge right now to discipleship in our culture. Outside of evangelism, one of our biggest challenges is having people who will just sacrifice some of their time. You cannot disciple someone from a distance. You have to give them freedom to come inside of your life. Sometimes that means uh, you need to invite your, uh, your, your mentee to your house just to have dinner. Don't tell the kids, because the kids will know they have to be on their best behavior. Let the kids just be normal. So that disciple can see you love, chastise, discipline your kids. That's modeling the Christian life. Take them with you. That's what Jesus did with his disciples. He took them with them. He did ministry with them. 
So it requires one-on-one. We, so we do that. We, we partner them up, and we tell our people, we'll give you whatever resources you need to disciple this person. It may be curriculum. It may be a book. There's a number of resources out there that we can equip you with to help in your discipling of a new person. But we tell every uh, person that's discipling someone, just because you make it through a curriculum doesn't mean that person is discipled. The goal is not to just get through the curriculum. The curriculum is a tool in your arsenal or in your toolbox to help you. The best discipleship happens life on life. When that, so when you can just ask the question, what was your biggest frustration this week? What was your biggest struggle this week? And they tell you it was hell at work this week. Well, what was that? My coworker, we were doing this project together. She didn't uphold or he didn't uphold his end of the deal, so I had to do all the work, and, I, and it wasn't good of a product, or, so, so my boss was upset with me. And I was just frustrated, and so I just, went, I just became belligerent towards my partner. I told them what I really thought of them, and I used some four-letter words that all you other Christians don't know and say. Or, or, or they tell you, what was your, or you ask them, what was your biggest temptation this week? Lust. Tell me the situation. See, see when, when I disciple someone, I tell them the only way that this is going to work is if we have this mutual understanding, and forgive me for this, but I think you'll get where I'm going with this, is that we've got this mutual agreement that there's no BS between the two of us. I'm going to be real with you, and you are going to be real with me. Otherwise, we're wasting each other's time. And so they have to give you permission, and you have to give them permission to ask the deep questions. What are you struggling with right now? And there has to be and, and the thing about it is, remember, discipleship is all about modeling. And so you as a disciple will have to model them what transparency looks like. That, which means that you are going to have to take some risk and tell them the truth about you. The real you. The one that you don't want the rest of us to know about. That means I have to let people see not pastor be. Not Pastor Reddick, but they have to see Brandon. You know, before there was the disciple or the apostle Peter, he was first Simon. And the truth of the matter is we all still have some Simon in us. And that's, we have to open ourselves up for people to see that we still struggle with that Simon at times. And so we give them a one-on-one partner, and then the next level of support is we say, listen, you need a, 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 a small group of people that you can study God's word with, that you can be challenged with. And so we have bridge groups here at the Bridge Church. And so we say, one-on-one partner and join a bridge group you, where you can have fun and fellowship, but, you were, but the focus is discipleship, so you're getting in, into God's word with the, the rest of of the believers, and, and that you can ask questions of things you don't understand, like divine sovereignty and free will, because we're going to come to a conclusion with that in one group session, right? <laughs> but then there's a place for you to still be transparent, where you can tell this group of people your struggle, a struggle that you're having. And guess what? As the group leader, I don't have to have all the questions because now in this group, it's a mixed group of males and females, people in different stages of life. And we can say, all right, group, we need to encourage our brother, our sister in Christ. And so we, 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 we have this one-on-one thing. We've got bridge groups. And then we say, make sure you show up to church on Sunday morning. Because this is where we do our primary teaching of the word. This is where there is oversight from the elders. Here's the point. And it's like preaching to the choir because y'all showed up this Sunday. You need to be in corporate worship on Sunday. It's crucial to your discipleship. 
Stop treating Sunday morning as an elective. Now, I don't want you to be legalistic about it, but you need to prioritize it. One of the things that I want to show you is that we have a plan for making disciples here at the bridge because we take the great commission seriously of making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that Christ has commanded. So we must share the gospel. We must support the new believer. Then what do Paul and Barnabas show us? Thirdly, there must be service. The new believer must serve the body. Number three, serve the body. Where do we see that? Verse 23, 23, excuse me. And when they had appointed elders from them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed to the Lord, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Paul and Barnabas, look what happens, gave certain qualified men authority to lead the church. They identified gifting in these qualified individuals, and they said, this is the best way for you to serve in the church. Now, not every disciple will be an elder, but every disciple will serve in some capacity, and that's going to be based on the gifting of the individual. Now, sometimes it's going to be based on the necessity of the body. I know, I know some of y'all are serving in the nursery right now, and that ain't your gifting. But you do it out of the necessity of being a part of a new church with limited resources, primarily human resources. So sometimes we do things out of necessity, but we want to be, we want the primary driver of our serving to be gifting. Because every believer is a gifted person, that means every, response, every person has a responsibility to express their gift through service. So every disciple has to serve. Serving is crucial to the body. Some disciples will serve as elders. Some disciples will serve as deacons. Some disciples will serve in the nursery. Others will serve on the hospitality team. Others will serve as deacons. Some will serve as greeters. Some will serve on the music team. But that it is crucial to, to discipleship that we learn to serve. Paul says later in 1 Corinthians that our serving is for the edification of the body, the building up of the body. These steps of serving, they are exactly what Jesus modeled for us when he was on the earth. For a time, Jesus' discipleship was by instruction. He taught them. But then, and they also observed him, living a life for the glory of God. But then in Matthew 10, he sends these disciples out. He says, you've had a lot of teaching, now it's time for testing. You've had enough time of observation. Now, you need to go and put in the practice of things that you've been taught. And so in Matthew 10, Jesus takes these disciples, these, these 12 disciples, and the text says he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction. A few verses down, he tells them, go to the lost sheep of Israel and proclaim to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice, the Bible says in Matthew 10 that Jesus gave them authority. That word authority can also be translated power. In other words, Jesus empowered his disciples to go and serve others. And that's what we must do in disciple making. Empower others, equip others to go and serve. We must empower new believers to love God and love others. Let's get back to Acts chapter 14. Paul and Barnabas, the text says they appointed elders. Elders church are simply pastors. Now, some elders will be teaching elders. I am a teaching elder. 
Now, all elders must be able to teach in order to be qualified to be an elder. That's in 1 Timothy chapter 3. But not all elders are going to stand up here and do what I do on a weekly basis. There will be some elders, we find out from 1 Timothy, that there are some elders who primarily, their primary job is to rule, to manage, to lead. And so, elders are simply pastors, and their task is to shepherd the flock. We'll see more of that when we get to Acts chapter 20. Their responsibility as elders is to lead and feed, which means that your job as sheep is to follow and swallow. Elders, hear me well. And you need to hear this too. Elders, your primary job is oversight of the discipleship of the local church. Your primary job is oversight of the discipleship of the local church. If we are not careful, we as elders will get bogged down in the minutia of ministry. We have oversight of the word. That's the word to elders. And you all can hold us responsible for that. But the fact that Paul and Barnabas appointed elders means that there's a duty for you as well. As sheep, your job your responsibility is to place yourself under the care of elders by joining a local church. Woo! Babe, I'm glad you're back in here. They won't talk to me this morning. Your job as sheep is to place yourself under the care of elders in a local church. And when you do that, then you say to the elders and, and to the rest of the membership of the church that you are, you are going to submit yourself to the leading, feeding, and care of those elders who have primary oversight of your discipleship. A couple of more implications from this appointment of elders. Number one, discipleship happens in the context of the local church. Let me say that again. Discipleship happens in the context of the local church. In the Bible, discipleship never takes place outside of the local church. Now, I said made some strong statements about the local church, and that's because I have a high view of the church. Why? Because Jesus died for the church. And, and now, We've earned a lot of this. A lot of folks don't want to have anything to do with the church. Because I told you before, there's no hurt like church hurt. We've earned a lot of the reputation that we have of being hypocrites and, and judgmental. And so what's happened over time is that that mentality has spilled over into the church. And now we have a laissez-faire attitude when it comes to the local church. We have this take it or leave it attitude when it comes to the local church. And what frustrates me the most is that the local church has outsourced so much of its responsibility to the parachurch ministries, the navigators, crew. By the way, I'm thankful for them, and I'm not preaching against them. Don't leave here saying that. I'm saying this on the video. I'm thankful for crew, I'm thankful for the navigators, I'm thankful for challenge, all these campus ministries and what have you. But their primary job is not to make disciples. Christ left that to his church. And we must be committed to making disciples. The local church is the primary engine for disciple making. Why? Because that is our mission. Get away from that mission Close the doors. Get away from the mission of disciple making. Dissolve. Go find a new church where they're committed to that because that's what God will bless. Now, I've talked to the church corporately. Let me talk to you individually. That means you, disciple, have a responsibility to get connected to a local church. 
you cap your growth. You stunt your growth when you divorce yourself from the local church. The church is, one image that we have from Scripture is, it's a family. When a disciple says that I don't need the church, that's like my daughter or my son saying to uh, my wife and I, we want a divorce. That's them saying to my wife and I, we don't need you. Now, I don't know which kid it was, but one of them got mad at us because they weren't getting their way. I can probably tell you which one it is, actually, but I won't do that. They got so mad because they were not getting their way one day. They said, I hate my family and had the nerve to slam the door. (laughs) Now, I was going to address that statement, but where I'm from, The first thing you had to know was, you don't slam my door. (laughs) If anybody's going to be slamming some doors, help me preach this thing. (laughs) So you don't slam my door. I will slam the door after I let you hit them streets since you hate me so much. You want to, you hate me, which means that you are rejecting my love even when it comes to discipline. That's for our family series, by the way. Well, let me show you what it looks like. Go out there and try to find some other family to take you in. That's going to feed you like you want to be fed because you got to have five meals a day. (laughs) Or that's going to take you to basketball and dance or drive to Kansas City right after your mama just came from Kansas City the day before and stay up there all day to watch these games. That cost $15 to get in, by the way, for one day. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you for letting me vent for a moment. I, I, I got to have get me a side job just running some basketball tournaments. It was $25 for the whole weekend. Okay, thank y'all. And so when a disciple says, I don't need the church, it's just like you saying, I don't need my family. Share the gospel, support the new believer, serve the body. What's the last step in disciple making? It's not done until that disciple starts reproducing. We want disciples that make disciples, that make disciples. Do you know what the next step is or what I want to say next? That make, oh, y'all good. And so the final step is you must send them out to multiply. Send out to multiply. Where do you see that in the text, Brandon? Verses 24 through 28. Verse 27 says, and when they had arrived and gathered the church together, that's Paul and Barnabas, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Actually, we could have gone back before that because the text tells us they went from this city to this city to Perga, and they declared the way there. The fact that there are churches in that city meant that somebody sent them. Go back. A few chapters in Acts, and we see the church in Antioch of Syria sending out Paul and Barnabas to go and declare the gospel to unreached people groups. The fact that these churches exist means that somebody was sent out to declare the gospel and start these churches. Friends, the Bridge Church exists today because somebody was sent. You and I are saved today because somebody was sent and shared the gospel with us. The local church, here I am again, is a sending agency. The local church is a sending agency. I can say it like this. The local church is a mission organization. The local church is a mission organization. 
We are guided by mission. We are filled with missionaries who are on mission. And every week we gather together so that we can be equipped, filled, encouraged to scatter, to go out, to be sent, to live life on mission. Now, that sending is going to look different from person to person. For some, this sending phase may look like, may look, may take place in a one-to-one relationship. For others, it may be leading a bridge group. For some of you, it may be leading in bridge kids or youth group. Mm. I do think, by the way, that even in our church, that there are some youth who could disciple some younger people. That's free. I won't charge you for that. For some of you, it may be leading a Bible study at your job. It may be you as a business owner leading by Christian principles. For some families, it may be us as a church sending you out for international and overseas missions whether that be short-term or long-term. It could be for some of you that in the future we send you with a church plant where there's not a gospel-centered church in a part of Wichita. We are all missionaries in the sense that we have been sent by God through Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit to be witnesses of everything Christ has done, Christ is doing, and Christ will do. So the question for some of us is, are we living a sent life? That's what we have to wrestle with. All right, you've got a preview of one of your small group questions this week. Are you living the sent life? Or are you just living a safe life? Following Christ is risky business. It is not safe. And guess what? God is still calling missionaries even now. This is our disciple-making pathway, our disciple-making strategy. Now, we can put some more meat on these bones, and we'll do that in small groups or, or one-on-one, but you've got a pathway to go make disciples. My job, my hope is that we help eliminate as many of these excuses. And I mean that graciously. Because if you're not, if we don't equip you, we've been negligent of our duty. My job as a pastor teacher, according to Ephesians 4, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And if we do not equip you to share the gospel, to support, to serve, to sin, we own that and we're going to be held responsible for that. When I get to heaven, God's going to hold me responsible for my stewardship of the British church. And so my goal is to help you understand that there is a pathway to making disciples. And it's going to be risky, It's going to require you to step out, maybe to even people that don't look like you, don't talk like you, don't vote like you, don't live where you live. That's because we've been called by Jesus to go make disciples, panta, ta, ethne, of all ethnicities, of all people groups, of all nations. And remember, Jesus was saying this to Jew. Typically speaking, ethne in the Bible is is translated Gentile. So he was saying to Jews, yeah, you're going to have to go talk to those unclean Gentiles. Love them, share the gospel, and then you're going to have to grow them yourself. Because this new community of people that I have created by my death, burial, and resurrection is called the church. And she is an international, multi-ethnic group of people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Worship team, you can make your way back to the stage.